Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today I'd like to talk about the secret of the rainbow yin yang. It's the logo of the new Thinking Aloud series and it's one of the rare works of art that I've created in my life. <laughs> First created it over 40 years ago and I've been working with it ever since. I, I was walking down Lake Street in San Francisco at the time and the idea just popped into my mind and uh, subsequently I created many versions using airbrush, using computer graphics and eventually the animated version that you're looking at right now. I actually own the copyright on over 800 different variations of the rainbow yin yang. But why? What does it signify? Um, there's actually a, a lot of deep meaning in the image. Back in the days when I was lecturing at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, we had an art exhibit of some six giant size rainbow yin yang images uh, that were di on display in the auditorium. And I actually gave a series of six lectures on the uh, metaphysical, symbolic, esoteric meaning of uh, the Yin Yang symbol and the rainbow Yin Yang in particular. Sometimes I jokingly say that it's the first major improvement on the Yin Yang in some 3,000 years. But one of the first things you'll notice when you look at the animated image, of course, is that it never stays the same. The colors are always changing and actually, uh, if you look more closely, you see the eye reflects the uh, fish, I'll call it the fish, the image on the opposite side. So, the first lesson of uh, the yin yang, of any yin yang image, is that everything contains with it, within it. Everything contains within it the seed of its own opposite. That's an incredibly profound insight. And, uh, and some of the interviews on this program, it's, it's been illustrated. Now, I know a lot of people don't enjoy it when I talk about politics because you may disagree with my political perspective, uh, or what you think my political perspective is. I did an interview with Glenn Aparicio Perry, a series of four interviews on uh, making America sacred again and uh, dealing with the, uh, the dance of the opposites in American politics and unity and diversity in American politics. And one thing we've seen quite dramatically, for example, is that the Democratic Party in American politics was once really the conservative racist party, the pro-slavery party in American politics, the Republican Party was the anti-slavery party. And things have pretty much reversed now. The Democrats are in the ones who uh, fostered the you know, civil rights movement. The Republicans are the ones who are uh, trying to slow down uh, civil rights <laughs> these days. So, uh, things reverse themselves over time. And this is a very important dynamic in human culture. So, it seems to me that whatever position you take or I take, whether uh, we are Democrats or communists or fascists or uh, upwingers or downwingers <laughs> or cynics or anarchists or conspiracy theorists or skeptics, sooner or later, those positions change because embodied within them, essentially, the, in, the seed of their own opposite is implicit in the position itself. Now, you've heard me sometimes say, uh, in fact, in particular in my monologue on non-duality, I embrace the whole. I embrace everything, the whole universe. 
And in the act of embracing the universe, there are no opposites any longer. There is no duality any longer. Uh, my friend Russell Targ loves the rainbow yin yang pins that are incidentally available on our website. You, you can, there's, a, there'll be a link. Uh, if you're interested in acquiring a rainbow yin yang pin in the description under this video, but he says it's a symbol of non duality and, and why it seems like, if anything, it's a symbol of duality. But actually, it, if you look at it carefully, uh, symbolically, it shows that the duality itself is only partially true. It's true at one level. For sure, we live in a world of duality, by which I mean we live in a world of good and evil, of right and wrong, of black and white. But actually, they merge with each other. <laughs> if it was a world of black and white, there would be no gray. And in a world of color, there would be no spectrum. Everything blends, every color blends into the next one. And uh, I bring this up because uh, I often hear from viewers who are convinced that there is some evil in the world. They've got to fight that evil. And uh, it's interesting how different it is for each viewer. For some of you, it's the elite, whoever they are. For others, it's the Satanists. I mean, what could be more evil than Satanists after all? For other people, it's the uh, Masons, believe it or not, or, or the alliance I've heard recently of Jews and Masons and Jesuits all working together uh, to foster a world of evil. For some people, it's the traditionalists. For other people, it's the scientists. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, and I understand that. I remember a time in my life when it seemed very important to take a stand. If you don't take a stand, it seems your life is lacking in meaning. But let me suggest to you, take a stand in favor of wholeness. Take a stand in favor of the universe, in favor of embracing everything. Take a stand in, in favor of the all-encompassing nature of reality itself. That's a hard thing to do sometimes. It means loving yourself in all of your complexity. In all, including loving the parts of yourself that you're inclined to hate and inclined to project out into the world. Uh, I, I encourage those of you who haven't listened to the first three uh, videos on the Impresent series to take a look at them because it deals with these, I think of them as the kindergarten lessons of the Impresent series one, two, and three. They're very important. And self-love is crucial, but in order to truly love yourself, as I point out there, it's worth repeating. That means loving yourself no matter what you do, say, think, or feel. And actually, when it gets right down to it, it means, well, we say it this way, having warm, positive regard, which is actually code for love for all other people, no matter what they do, say, think, or feel recognizing, in effect, the spiritual essence that unites us all. And I used to teach all of this in a seminar called Omega Seminars, founded by a man named John Boyle many decades ago. I don't believe Omega Seminars has been active for a long time. But back in those days when I was a seminar leader, people would bring up the example of Hitler. They say, do I have to love Hitler too? And we would say, no, that's too hard. Don't push yourself. <laughs> But actually, yes, it includes Hitler. <laughs> and, and I know that's a tough one uh, for people who think that Hitler is evil. I actually hear from people who feel the other way about Hitler. And there's much to be said about, uh, you know, the role of darkness in the evolution of humanity. And there's also much to be said, as I point out in one of the earlier In Presence monologues, about the cosmic game, about getting beyond the mere human perspective, uh, you know, where uh, death is tragic and, and life is good, because sometimes death is beautiful and sometimes life is ugly. So, 
<laughs> from a cosmic perspective, even things as basic as life and death may not look the way they look to us uh, in, uh, if we just see the world through our mortal human eyes. And I think we are cosmic beings. We are much more than mere humans. Much more. This, this human, uh, garb that we wear is, is sort of temporary dressing. I, I, <laughs> certainly, if you take the reincarnation research seriously, as I do, certainly if you take, uh, some of the research on survival after death seriously, as I do, certainly if you take the research on the powers of the mind, uh, as expressed through what we call, and they're not the best words, but extra sense sensory perception and psychokinesis, if you take that seriously, as I do, um, as an empiricist, as a scientist, and you have to look at the implications. And the implications clearly are that the limitations of space and time that we perceive through our bodily senses and that seem to be the the world in which we live or the prison in which we live or the movie in which we live, uh, that world is not complete. That's a partial description of reality. And there is another description that we see when we look within, and that's a cosmic reality. Maybe expressed uh, most eloquently uh, by people who talk about the, the coming of the cosmic Christ, the heart of the world, the feeling of compassion for everything, for every sentient creature, for all beings on all levels. Open your heart to that. Open your heart to that. And let me leave you now with this question. In your particular case, what would you say is stopping you from opening your heart to everything, to all and everything, to the wholeness of the entire universe, in fact, to the wholeness of all multiverses. What prevents you from having an open heart as far as infinity? Thank you for being with me.